Namaste. So the last time, Shiva was talking about how when the mind moves, even a little bit, that's samsara. And when the mind is still, that's moksha, liberation. So today we're going to talk about some techniques on how to still the mind. But first, the next verses. The happiness attained in this aloneness is the highest boundless bliss, which learned persons will not revel in that supreme reality in which there is absolutely no action. Tell me, being rid of worldly knowledge, the great hero who has acquired pure wisdom in which there are no sense objects and which is all-pervading and without form, will attain immutable moksha without fail, even though he may have no desire to attain liberation. So this is the perfect state. This is the freedom from suffering, freedom from birth and death, moksha, liberation, peace, shanti. Huh? How do we attain this? By stilling the mind. That was the essence of the last verse. When the mind abides firmly and motionlessly in the state of self, that is mukti. So how do we stop this mind? The mind is like a whirlpool. It's like a vortex. It has tremendous momentum, tremendous energy due to habit. So how do we stop it? Well, we stop it by awareness. Shiva says here, this um, supreme awareness, huh? where there is no action, no motion, no movement. And last time we were talking about how the whole mind is based on I, the thought of I and mine. So practically speaking, how do we, how do, we do this? How do we stop the mind? Uh, like, a, like a whirlpool that sucks everything into its vortex. The mind is uh, so vicious and persistent, it takes a long time. <clears throat> but by regular effort, you can do it. And here's how you do it. There are two kinds of consciousness in ordinary life. And one is called immediate consciousness. That when a perception comes in through the senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, or the mind, we simply perceive it as it is. Uh, for example, I look at this wall behind me. Well, what do I see? Just an expanse of white. That's immediate consciousness. That's what I see. Then there's reflexive consciousness. Reflexive consciousness is when the mind analyzes the perception, compares it to previous perceptions, and then categorizes it or labels it. Oh, this is a wall. Now, the next thing is the mind injects the idea of I or mine. And this is called a conceit. Uh, a conceit means something made up, something artificial, something projected onto the reality, something that's not really there. <laughs> Imagination, in a word. So the mind imagines this thing called I and then makes also imagines the relation mine, and projects it on the perceptions. So now we have my sight, my hearing, my smell, my taste, my touch, my thoughts. 
you see. And if you watch your mind very, very carefully in a detailed way, you can observe this. Just look at something. Like if I look out the window here, I see a bunch of green. That's all it is, just a mass of green. But if I allow my mind to come in, then it goes, oh, that's a palm tree, that's a hibiscus bush, and, you know, all this categorization, recognition, see, identification. And then it thinks, oh, this is my vision. This is what I am seeing. You watch it. Every second, or even fraction of a second, there are impressions, perceptions, coming into the mind. So you have to sit there. Well, you can actually do it sitting, standing, lying down, walking, <laughs> working. You could do this at any time. You just have to be attentive, be aware, and be a very detailed observer. So that's it. That's the technique. That's how you stop your mind. Oh, did I say stop thoughts? No. You can't stop thoughts because it's the business of the mind to think. But what you can do is you can inject awareness. And when you inject awareness into a habitual process of identification and projection, it'll stop by itself. Why? Because it's so embarrassing. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> Just by seeing this, you'll go, eh, you know, it'll stop by itself. Like, you cannot be angry when you're aware, when you're awake. Huh? You cannot be depressed or self-pitying or uh, envious or any of those negative emotions. As soon as you're awake, as soon as you're aware, they stop by themselves, don't they? because they're embarrassing. They're like, ew. <laughs> you know? I'm better than that. I don't think that. So, in the same way, if you observe this habitual mental activity, then slowly, slowly it will stop. And the best time to do this, the very best time to do this, is first thing in the morning when you wake up. Think of it before you go to sleep at night. Make the determination, make the intention. When I wake up, then I'm going to observe my mind and see how it overlays and projects I and mine on my perceptions. And then when you wake up in the morning, you see the first thought you have will be that. Then you watch your mind. Just watch it. So the other point is, why does this cause suffering? Why does this habitual projection, identification, and uh, acquisition, the Buddha calls it, huh? making something mine, how does this cause suffering? Well, he uses the example of a whirlpool. A whirlpool or a vortex occurs when a stream of water is moving along. Actually, it can be any medium, any energy. It's moving along smoothly. And then it encounters an obstacle. I used the uh, example the other day of an ocean wave hitting the beach. The wave is moving along in the ocean just fine. But then when it hits the beach, one side, the bottom side of the wave, now is, encounters an obstacle. So what happens is part of the water tries to turn back 
against the flow. And because it's going against the flow, it creates this vortex, this circular motion. This is the mind. See, the world is anicca dukkha anatta, which means impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. That's the way the world is. That's the way life is. That's the way everything is. Everything that can be experienced is anicca dukkha anatta. But we try to counteract this and make it nitya ananda atma to make it permanent, enjoyable, and self. Isn't it? You watch. Every desire you have, every effort you make, every work that you do is some kind of effort to make the world permanent, enjoyable, and self. Let's say, for example, you have a friend or any kind of relationship. But I'm using the example of a friend because it's pretty neutral. You have a friend. You want to have that friend forever. You don't want your friend to go away. Especially, you don't want your friend to reject you. Isn't it? That means you want it permanent. Nitya. But nothing in this world is permanent. I mean... In the ultimate case, one of you is going to die. <laughs> Actually, eventually, both of you. And this is dukkha. This is unsatisfactory. This is suffering. See, If it was satisfactory, then it would be perfect. But it's not. Nothing in this world is perfect. Nothing meets our expectations or predictions. See, because it's not self. <laughs> this is this is so elementary. It's like duh, you know. But it's think about it. It's true. So nothing in this world is self. If we have a friend, for example, we want our friend to agree with us, uh, to like the same things, to want to do the same things, and so on and so on. Well, what if our friend disagrees? What if our friend wants to do something else? Then it's a problem, right? Because our friend is not ourself. Our friend is somebody else. And they can do whatever they want. So sometimes they're going to do what they want to do. See, isn't that just life? Isn't that just the way it is? So the world is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. But we make all these plans, all these efforts, so many desires, uh, so many predictions. Uh, we do so much work, so much thinking and everything, just to make the world permanent, pleasurable, and self. Guess what? All will fail. This is suffering. This is dukkha. And when we create it, we make it ourselves. Look at animals. They don't struggle against their nature. They don't struggle against the world. Yeah, they make efforts, you know, to eat and so on like that. But they don't they don't have any fundamental disagreements <laughs> with the way the world is. But look at humans. We have this theory this story that everything should be nice, you know, that we should enjoy, huh? and like that. And we can enjoy, but not if we struggle against the basic nature of the world, the basic nature of life. Uh, those, those are not going to change, ever. Why? Because the whole world is simply an imagination, simply a dream. It's meant to be impermanent. It's, it's, it's by nature unsatisfactory. 
And it's absolutely not self. It's other. See, structurally, the world will never match our expectations, our ego desires. So that's why it's said that as long as the ego is there, there'll be suffering. When the ego goes, the suffering goes. And our basic nature of happiness is there. The only thing obscuring that happiness is our efforts against the nature of reality. <laughs> so we make so many plans, so many efforts. We create so many abstractions, ideas, philosophies, politics, religion. Uh, we, we make up so many plans and desires, and we try to execute them. Uh, we build these huge corporations and get money and all this stuff just to try to reverse the natural conditions or the nature of the world and reality. It's not going to work, people. I'm sorry. Give it up. So if you simply do these two things, stop trying to change the nature of the world and stop projecting I and mine on everything that you experience. That's it. You'll be happy. The mind will no longer be agitated. There will be no more suffering because we won't be creating it anymore. <laughs> so this is the secret, and this is one very powerful technique. Huh? You see some of the Buddhist monks like Ajahn Chah. Huh? Ajahn Chah. You look at a picture of him. He's like a tiger. He's very fierce and alert. Why? Because it's his habit to observe his mind at every moment. With very, very sharp attention. By doing that, he prevents the arising of the thought, I and mine. And because of that, he's in bliss. He's free. He has no more suffering. See, he has applied this technique. Or my Buddhist mentor, Jnanananda. Uh, the Buddhist monks in, uh, in Sri Lanka don't like Jnanananda, or they didn't like him. He's, he's left his body now. But uh, they didn't like him. Why? Because he was so sharp, so unremittingly brilliant. Everything he said was just so perfect huh? and so deep that they felt embarrassed to be in his presence. They felt like beginners, and they are. Huh? They don't even meditate. I mean, these monks. But anyway... If you simply apply this simple method, then uh, you'll get fantastic results very quickly. But you have to do it methodically. Huh? You have to do it with discipline, not just a half hour in the morning and a half hour at night. All the time. You have to make it a habit, as much of a habit as creating I and mine in the first place as much of a habit as struggling against the nature of the world has built up in us. But when you get to that point, you're free. You're done. Huh? And then you can enjoy the, the real nature, uh, the real self-nature, self with a capital S. <laughs> Eternal, pleasurable, and self. Aung Tatsat. Aung Harihi Aung.